As you can see, a connection with nature is important for creating a comfortable lifestyle within the city and its surroundings. But just how do we go about getting the people to recognize and appreciate this valuable resource? In our next segment, you'll discover the Intertwine Alliance, a collaboration of private landowners, government agencies such as the BLM, park services, forestry, and more. These organizations have joined with nonprofit organizations to help ensure that the public trail system remains accessible and intact. We sent Holly Fee to visit this vital local alliance and find out how it came to be in 2011 and what its future holds. Hi, today we're here with the Intertwine Alliance and our guests are Mike Wetter and Judy Bluehorse Skelton. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for Thanks. having us. Can you tell us first and foremost, where are we today and is it part of the Alliance? We are at the Oaks Bottom Wildlife Refuge and it is part of the Intertwine, yes. How long has it been part of the Intertwine or about, about how long? Uh, I think it's the first wildlife preserve that was created in the city of Portland. Uh, started about eight years ago, actually the idea for the Intertwine, and it started with this idea, uh, this recognition by some of our uh, region's civic leaders that every significant accomplishment that we'd achieved, um, whether it be the creation of a wildlife refuge like this or a major new trail, um, always had one common denominator, and it, it involved a coalition of public, private, and nonprofit organizations and leaders. And so the idea behind the Intertwine Alliance originally was rather than put that coalition together every time we want to do to do something big Why not put it together and keep it together and just keep doing big things? Yeah, there is some confusion about uh, the name the intertwine because it actually means two different things uh, The intertwine itself is a place. That's the parks trails and natural areas in the Portland Vancouver region the intertwine Alliance and the intertwine itself is uh, a hallmark of planning for future generations, of whether we call that sustainability or planning for the seventh generation to come. And so um, part of this intertwine is uh, reclaiming and, and restoring what was uh, industrialized and lost in the last century. We, we will have to clean up and, and heal the past to uh, set a good uh, intention for the future. And I think I think that's what a lot of the partners on the Intertwined Alliance and the people that um, uh, they serve, the youth that they serve, I think that's also what guides the work they're doing mm -hmm. is uh, what, what we are healing and what we are leaving for future generations. Yeah, you know, it used to be that people thought of nature as something that was outside of the city. You know, that the metropolitan region was where people lived. You know, outside of the metropolitan area was where nature lived. And what we found when we took that approach is that we were disconnecting people from nature. That ultimately, when nature was something out there, people didn't relate to it and they didn't understand it and they didn't experience it as part of their everyday lives. And so part of the, ideas behind, the idea behind the intertwine is that nature is right here. It's part of our everyday lives. It lives right here with us in the metropolitan area. We just have to step out the back door or look up. Right. Yeah. Yeah, you, I agree. It's great. Well, this has been a great day here at Oaks Bottom. We've learned so much about the Intertwine and the Intertwine Alliance. Mike, Judy, any parting words for our guests? Well, the Intertwine Alliance is where leaders collaborate and we are all leaders in this. And one thing that everybody can do uh, is step out their door and uh, enjoy the Intertwine. Yeah, I would agree. Um, get out, reconnect, um, remember, and um, get involved on the intertwine. Wonderful words of wisdom, definitely beliefs to live by. I'm Holly Fee, giving you the tools to be sustainable today. Wow, what a great idea. And since these trails wind their way through places like Howell Territorial Park, right here on Savi's Island, they offer a great opportunity to sample the local flora and fauna. That's right, Kaylin. And this month, Eating Well will take us out on the trail where we'll discover hazelnuts, blackberries, and other fabulous fruits. Then Christina James and Holly Fee will show us how to make the most of what they find. Thanks for joining us on another episode of Eating Well. I'm Holly Fee. And I'm Christina James. This month we're going to be producing delicious fruit cobbler. These were picked on Sovie Island Farms. Jason went out there just the other day with three boys and they had a heyday picking. I guess it was just absolutely gorgeous and there was a plethora of fruit. I found one that was 
Well, I don't know about you guys. I've never made a cobbler, but I love eating cobbler. So let's get started. Okay, so when you're cutting your peaches, you just want them nice and thin as though it's gonna be a thin apple slice. And you can see, hopefully, that my knife just goes right through that peach. That tells you that the peach is perfectly ripe and ready to be devoured. All right, I'll go ahead and get started. The thing about fruit in our Pacific Northwest is we have an abundance of it this time of year. Okay, so it looks as if we have got enough peaches. Awesome. And it looks as though you're gonna get to have one all to yourself. Let's make the mix. Mm, okay, I'm gonna let you it. do this part, but okay. I'm, I'll guide you, but I'm gonna let you do it. Okay, all so right. go ahead and open that bad boy up. Okay. This is our pre-made pancake mix. All right. Often when we're in the backcountry, we're not bringing bowls, we're not bringing measuring cups, so it's all about consistency. Okay. So, you know, you start small and then add if you have to, okay? That so looks it's about, like it's about half. Right. Do you want me to pour? I do. Okay. You're going to do it all. How much should I pour? Let's start off with about just about a quarter of that jar. All right. Another secret ingredient to cooking is, especially when it comes to mixes like this, pancakes, biscuits, and that sort of thing, you know, there's a certain amount of leavening in the mix, and so mm. you don't want to over stir. Do you think we yeah, need more water? Nope. I think that's going to be just fine. So you want it, I don't know if you've ever made dumplings or anything like that, you want it that same type of consistency. Okay. Thicker than pancake, thinner than biscuit. The sugar helps break down the fruit, so we're not going to need to add that much. So let's just add about three tablespoons. Alright. Well, a little bit of sugar is always a good idea. I know. Kids love it too. It is seasoned. Why don't you go ahead and pour those on in. Alright. All of it? All of it. Okay. That looks good. It's gonna be delicious. So we've got a nice sugar-coated peaches. You can tell that the sugar's already starting to break down those peaches. Yeah. And then we wanna add some delicious blackberries. Look at the size of these blackberries. Yeah, those are huge. They are, and you know, you can get these, blackberries are everywhere. They're such abundant in Oregon. Actually, sometimes they can be a little bit of a bugger, can't they? So I've kind of covered the peaches with the blackberries. Okay, that looks great, by the way. Yum. I'm going to give it just one more scoop because I love blackberries so much. There you go. Okay, now, now for the fun part, <laughs> adding the biscuits. Here we go. Okay. Where's that spoon that we got have? it right, right here. There. So how much do I need to add? Well, you, this is kind of basically a tablespoon. So you want to have good dollop amounts so, and just fill make a nice, thick, juicy consistency. It's amazing how much fruit breaks down into its natural juices when cooked. I cannot wait to see the yep. final product. Yep. You're pretty much going to cover this, and as it bakes, it's going to break down and get heavy and just fill. And get one more. What you want to do with your fire is get a good bed of coals going so you're going to be able to burn consistent for the amount of time you need to cook your cobbler. In this case, we're going to cook the cobbler at least 30 minutes. So we've got this great bed of coals right up here in front, and I think it's time to put that bad boy on there. All right. There you right go. Take your there. time. Yep. Hot. Ooh. There you go. So I think it's been about 30 minutes. Let's just check it first. Oh, oh yeah. Okay. So you see that the cobbler is nice and crispy around the outside and the biscuit is nice and doughy and it looks as if it is done. Mm. <laughs> What's everybody think? Mm. Well, there you go. It looks like this cobbler is a success. Campfire cobbler, basic ingredients. You can do it at home in your backyard. You can do it with friends at a picnic. Take it into the backcountry, wherever. Just make it your own. Thanks for joining us on Eating Well.